Hello, my name is David Lyon. I want to share with you some work in progress, some research and writing that I'm doing about uh, surveillance cultures. This is something that I've been working on for some time and I'll explain as I go along what it is that I'm about. Within a particular section, I'm thinking about what we might call the growing gaze. And I'm thinking of uh, three different sorts of eyes that uh, might be gazing. The omniscient eye, the metaphorical eye, and the reflexive or the reciprocal eye. By the omniscient eye, I'm thinking of common understandings of surveillance where there is uh, an all-knowing eye that can see uh, an increasingly large number of things and in this case persons and uh, that's associated with things like uh, the panopticon in the work of Foucault or perhaps uh, Big Brother in uh, Orwell's depiction of 1984. But I think it's also important to consider the metaphorical eye. That is to say when we're not thinking only of a literal and uh, visual gaze but something that is uh, more literary and uh, virtual. So when I think of the metaphorical eye, I'm thinking of ways in which uh, other forms of collections of personal data, of uh, images perhaps, but of other kinds of personal information might be processed uh, and might still be uh, overlaid with that metaphor of seeing, uh, surveillance, and uh, visuality, but not be literally to do with seeing. So there's the metaphorical eye, and uh, I would argue that during the 20th century and uh, early 21st century, the ways in which the metaphorical eye has expanded have been considerable. But the focus of what I want to say just now has to do with that third, the reflexive eye or the reciprocal eye. And uh, I want to explain a little bit more what I mean by that. So that's my entry point. In some research and writing about surveillance, you might imagine that the growing gaze refers simply to how surveillance technologies allow more and more of our lives to be seen by organizations of different kinds. But this is only part of the story. Put that way, it overestimates what surveillance technologies can do, and it underestimates what we do to be seen and how we ourselves actually engage in surveillance. And what I want to say just now, we see that while surveillance technologies have been developed in ways that make them ubiquitous, they have also become an accepted part of the cultural landscape. During the 1990s and early part of the 20th, uh, 21st century, I contributed to the debate over surveillance society initiated by uh, scholars such as James Rule and Gary Marx. By this term I meant that the contours of an emerging social formation could be discerned in the control and uh, coordination functions of new technologies dependent on information infrastructures and that these raised fresh questions about power and democratic participation. I was thinking of the ways that surveillance is no longer merely sporadic and uh, occasional, uh, local and uh, often remote, but was reaching into the capillaries of everyday ordinary living. As I put it in the subtitle to my little book, Surveillance Society, we could now think of surveillance in the 21st century as monitoring everyday life. Well, more than a decade ago, I, I promised that I would return to these questions to try to fill out the picture by considering more closely the role of ordinary people in everyday life who encounter these new kinds of surveillance. How do we respond to and relate to surveillance and under what circumstances do we resign ourselves to it or even resist it? And what difference might these varied responses make? Well, 9-11 intervened, and for a while I was preoccupied with pressing issues prompted by the intensification of surveillance, now prominently in the service of security, or more properly, national security, defined in a particular way. 
Questions of civil liberties and human rights were pushed agonizingly into the foreground by no-fly lists, extraordinary rendition, new biometrics regimes in airports and the like. Carelessness with surveillance data was central to the tragic and needless travesties of justice that occurred and are still occurring. But the question of how we are all involved with and uh, interact with surveillance doesn't go away. While the post 9-11 context in the global north offers many important examples, many other developments, social, political, economic and technological, continue to generate questions about what I now want to call cultures of surveillance. The accent here then is on how surveillance morphs into uh, what Ray Raymond Williams might have called a whole way of life, of which we're aware and in which we engage in a variety of ways. Popular awareness of surveillance has grown rapidly in the post 9-11 period. Think of full body scanners in airport security regimes, for example. But equally, the proliferation of cell phones and the rise of social media have also played a tremendously important part. So, whereas once we might have said that we occasionally encounter surveillance, increasingly we are enrolled in the system. And while it may be true to say that uh, in if you like surveillance society terms, we're increasingly enveloped by surveillance. We also actively engage with surveillance. The technologies may be a necessary part of the story and they're used by government administration of all kinds, plus marketers, police and security services, part of what drives them. But surveillance, I want to suggest, is also us it has become an intrinsic part of the whole way of life. Surveillance emerges from an historically specific network of human and uh, non-human actants and technical components, and at a certain point informs and influences whole societies. Indeed, I suggest that today it is a way of being, a component of culture. So while our bodies, our lives, may in a sense be subject to surveillance, it's also illuminating to think of them as constituted in part by surveillance. So what might I mean a little bit more precisely about the reflexive eye, this eye of what I'm thinking of as surveillance cultures? I'm using the reflexive eye simply in the sense that the eye, as it were, bends back. The sight lines point in both directions, which may be why reciprocal might be a better way of thinking about it. The subject, it turns out, isn't separate from surveillance in any strong sense at all. Uh, we're both constituted by and engaged with surveillance. So. In this view, surveillance is less uh, technology for the few, whether state and corporation, state or corporation, to see the many, and more a matter of first the encounter, the enrollment, the envelopment, and uh, perhaps in the end, as I'm suggesting, active engagement. So I'll just enlarge a little bit on some of these and add three qualifications as a way of sharing these thoughts in progress. So, perceived first as a, a cultural intrusion, forms of surveillance uh, were viewed in, from the 19th century and earlier, in fact, onwards, uh, as something that disturbed or interfered with life. Um, an invasion of personal or uh, that 20th century private space. Um, but increasingly we see it as part, of, part and parcel of the contemporary world. It's the way things work. It's how we do things. And indeed, it is in many ways the basic organizational mode in the 21st century. And so you have people like Scott McNeely saying, well, you have zero privacy, get over it. So there's a sense in which uh, there's a proposed cultural shift there as surveillance becomes ubiquitous as a way of doing things. And uh, that which has previously given us pause and made us wonder about surveillance is supposedly, according to some, out of the window. 
So the mode of subject involvement with surveillance alters over time. The encounter is a situation where uh, surveillance is unusual, exceptional, occasional. Um, we, we occasionally get stopped by the police in a, uh, what we call in Canada, a ride program to check that we're not drinking and driving. The workplace monitoring catches those keystrokes. It becomes more systematic as records are built and bureaucratically uh, our profiles start to circulate electronically. So gradually we're enrolled in the system. We want to participate increasingly and our participation depends on the record. Uh, we need to have our names on the list of voters in order to be able to vote in an election. That has been, that's something that has been with us for 200, nearly 300 years. But we are also wanting to be sure that if we are unemployed, for example, the benefits that uh, the state provides for which we are eligible will indeed be accessible to us. Or uh, if we go to a supermarket and we use the same supermarket over and over, we may use our loyalty cards in a way that allows them to collect and process our personal data, but uh, has certain benefits for us. So we become, one way and another, the bearers of our own surveillance, as Foucault would have said. We are complicit in those processes. And then over time, surveillance becomes more and more part of our everyday environment, whether through ub ubiquitous cameras or through digital components built into more and more dimensions of everyday life, consumption as well as production, entertainment as well as citizenship. This is our envelopment in surveillance. With body scanners and behavioural observation in airports, overhead cameras in the street, Facebook stalking and tracking, corporate loyalty programmes, trading personal information, health, welfare and employment databases, tracking our accounts, RFID chips and Google Street View checking our locations, perhaps a drone tracing our movements from time to time from above, ticketing and uh, consumer purchasing databases. It's hard not to think that we're not under constant surveillance, living in a surveillance world. But that same world, I want to suggest, is one in which we are participating much more actively. We engage surveillance on our own account. We use Amazon, Google and Facebook, even though we know them to be surveillance. And we learn how to benefit from surveillance. In Britain, the uh, housing market, it is argued by some, is being affected by the use of online access for ordinary people who have discovered where they are located within the geodemographic classification systems that marketers have been using for nearly 20 years now, but are using those data in order to relocate themselves physically, geographically, in other areas or in other neighbourhoods. And so there is a reciprocal effect engaged in that gaze. We can also see how corporations and other organisations benefit from surveillance and as devices come on the market, we may end up buying them for ourselves. Monitors, trackers, tracers, from caller ID to GPS to domestic camera systems and eventually to routine use of smartphones or Facebook for checking on others. All these are areas where there is ongoing current research and I think it adds up to the development of surveillance cultures. But let me add a few qualifications here. One, when I speak of surveillance cultures, I'm really using that plural quite deliberately. There are overlapping and multi-layered uh, cultures of surveillance that both help to constitute us and that we help to constitute. And they involve varying kinds of engagement, response and initiative. Michel de Certeau speaks of ways in which the public panoptic gaze may be subverted or deflected. For instance, in what he calls la perruque, when workers give the impression that they are busy, busily labouring, when in fact they are doing their own work. John Gilliam shows how women on welfare may dissemble before computer casework systems, not to resist surveillance, but rather to be able to care better for their children. The resisting surveillance is, as it were, a spin-off, a side effect. Equally, others may use surveillance to their advantage as in the case of the, uh, those who go online, to find where they are located 
and to try to make a difference using the knowledge about the ways in which they have been located. A further qualification is to say that these surveillance cultures are only seen with any clarity in certain specific contexts at the moment. In others, they may as yet only be dimly discerned. But once the interactions between surveillance or representations of surveillance and ordinary people in everyday life start to take hold, as they have in some uh, areas, they do indeed become part of our self-constitution. As in the case of showing ID, for example, the fact of having to submit to official identification has effects on how we see ourselves and indeed on our identities. When for decades driver's licenses have sufficed for crossing the Canada-US border, having to produce a passport is likely in the long run to emphasize the differences rather than the similarities between being Canadian and being American. And then the third qualification is this. When it comes to using smartphones uh, to video police at political process to video police at political protests, it shouldn't be imagined that little brother systems have anything like the power of large scale, but rather that we have been naturalized into surveillance. It is something with which we engaged. We're normalized. We may not love Big Brother, but we're resigned to his presence. And we've even to st started to think like him, act like him. There may, of course, be profound political repercussions of using smartphones at demonstrations. But my point here is simply that ordinary people will use such devices in ways that mirror police video surveillance. The post 9-11 cultures of fear and TV shows accenting the success of CCTV help us believe that surveillance, at least of a camera kind, is necessary. The rewards on our loyalty card systems show us not only that there are no harmful consequences, but also that parting with personal data is a means of bettering ourselves materially. And like all technology, surveillance may have some downsides, we think, but overall things are still getting better. Thus we come to see ourselves as part of a surveillant world, accepting the advertising ploys that depend on surveillance motifs, seeing the entertainment dimensions of surveillance situations, and accepting surveillance requirements as a means of participation in social life. Ironically, we show ID, use passwords, and depend on complex codes in order to live in freedom. In the end, as Jonathan Finn, writing about uh, camera surveillance, says, we are also willing, conscious producers of surveillance. We actively participate in the surveillance of ourselves and others to the extent that surveillance is fully enmeshed in our lives. So I suggest we are entering an era of surveillance cultures, where surveillance is part of a whole way of life. Surveillance isn't just to do with technologies, isn't just to do with uh, the means of social control. We are part of it. Surveillance has become us. In this case, it seems to me that we need to consider even more carefully these social and cultural practices and take a look at the ways in which we desire to watch, record and display our lives to others. Thank you very much.